It's the first new moon after the vernal equinox, and a king stands bare in a temple. He's removed all of his regalia, his quilted robes, his crown and sword lay beside him. He stands in a temple before a high priest, in the Babylonian equivalent of underwear. Together, they're in the temple of Marduk, the patron god of Babylon, who represents justice and regeneration. The priest looks the king in his eyes, and the king stares back unblinking. Then the priest raises his hand and slaps the king in the face. The king's eyes close with the swing, and he finds himself looking down at the ground over his left shoulder, cheek stinging. Tears well up in his eyes. Then he turns to look back at the priest. The priest jocks his head quickly to look at the king's face, eyes impatiently scanning. Then he sees the stream of tears run down the king's face. And both men smile. They exit the building and the priest informs the city that the king is worthy of ruling for another year and the New Year's celebrations continue. Now, who knows how accurate this ritual is after 6,000 years of playing telephone. But what is certain is that the oldest holiday humans have celebrated is the New Year. Every ancient civilization has their own traditions about going around the sun. Now, which day is the new year is up for debate. Many celebrations originated with the spring equinox. Once people discovered that the day is split evenly between sunlight and darkness. Until Julius Caesar thought better of it. He believed the New Year celebration should start on the day that he set in his new calendar, January, for the god Janus, who has two faces, one that looks into the past and the other into the future, which got embedded into our Gregorian calendar and the schedule was set for the next 2,000 years. Although the day has changed, the sentiment hasn't. There is a human instinct to show gratitude, to acknowledge the passage of time. This celebration marks the difference between living and being alive. And in 1889, there is one woman who is so grateful for what this wild year has brought her. I'm Adrian Bain, and this is Strangers Abroad, a race around the world, based on the true story of Elizabeth Bisland. Day 46, December 29th. After leaving Penang, Liz sails northwest on the Bay of Bengal for three days. Then on the night of the 29th, they arrive in the harbor of Colombo Salon. And although she can't see this island yet, she surely can smell it. That night, the passengers sleep on the ship, but Liz wants a taste of her newest stop. So she cracks open her porthole and takes in the redolent air. 
Whiffs of lemongrass, nutmeg, and salt water pour through her window and flavor her room. She takes a deep inhale, so she will be mentally transported back to this moment whenever these smells pass her by in the future. As she falls asleep, she leaves the porthole open so the air can season her dreams. She can't wait to see what this sweet and salty island looks like. Day 47, December 30th. The next morning, when Liz wakes up and looks at the island, it's better than any dream she had the night before. She stands on the deck in awe. Beyond the massive breakwater, the harbor curves with the rims of white beaches filled with foam where palms lean over to look at themselves in a sea of green mother of pearl. Inland, the purple distance rise in lofty outlines, deliciously softened and rounded by their enormous garment of verdure. The soil is red, the color of ground cinnabar, deep tinted as if soaked with dragon's blood. Tulip trees Massive white buildings with arched and pillared arcades. The vividness of color here is astonishing. Bright, intense like the colors of precious stones. We doubt the evidence of our senses. Doubt the earth can be so red. The sea and sky so blue. A place so beautiful, it is believed that this was where Adam was banished to soften the blow of not being in Eden. His tears turned to pearls. Liz feels goosebumps rise on her arms. When Liz and her fellow passengers touch land, she also takes the extended walk through the markets, passes under palm trees, and goes along the perfectly smooth red roads, just like Nellie did. Only Liz is already sad that she has to leave this gorgeous place. Where Nellie feels time slowed down in Japan, Liz starts to feel her time pick up the pace. She doesn't like it. She only gets two days in this mysterious island before she's off for the Middle East. But one look at her stunning hotel distracts her from her yearning. Liz arrives in the Grand Oriental Hotel and she marvels at the cool stone buildings, the inner courtyard with bright light and dotted with orchids. The hotel is packed. Everyone saunters around in light white clothing, as cool as the stone marble they walk on. Liz notices that the clientele seem to have loftier positions here. This isn't just a hotel. It's a passing ground for the most influential travelers. A place to pause between the far reaches of Eurasia. That afternoon, she goes to the dining hall for lunch in a white room reminiscent of a Greek temple. She admires the flashes of color at the center of each pristine table filled with bowls of technicolor tropical flowers. As Liz sits down for Tiffin, Liz scans the room and straightens her back. At each circular table is someone of importance from some far off corner of the world. At one table is the grandson of a famous English poet. At another table is Lord Chesterfield, a British Army officer 
who rose to prominence in Africa. On the other side was Dom Le Augusto, the grandson of Emperor Pero II of Brazil, and half a dozen more people of influence who just happened to be here on their voyage around the world. This is the room where it happens. Bits of wealth, brutality, and imperialism all sitting in one space together, sucking down curry on seashells. This hodgepodge of influence turns this rich island into a way station. What a strange way to travel. Only thinking about conquest and power. Liz thinks what a disservice it is to only see the world as something to exploit instead of enjoying it for its beauty and complexity. When Tiffin ends, Liz has the quintessential salon experience. When the jewelry merchants come in, Liz buys at least two rings for each finger. Then when she's done, she goes outside to be happily entertained by the magicians. A snake charmer is squatting in the dust before the hotel, performing feats of juggling. A small flat basket is where the cobra is coiled. He takes off the cover of the snake basket, the reptile lying suddenly sluggish until wrapped over the head induces him to lift himself angrily, puffing out his throat and making ready to strike. But his master is playing a low, monotonous tune on a tiny bamboo flute. With his eyes fastened upon the snake's eyes and swaying his nude body slowly from side to side, the serpent stirs restlessly and flickers his wicked, thin, red tongue. But the sleepy tune drones on and on, and the body moves to and fro, to and fro. Presently, the serpent begins to wave softly, following the movements of the man's body, and with his eyes fixed on the man's eyes, and so in time, sinks slowly into a languid heap of relaxed folds, the music grows fainter and fainter and dries away into a breath of whisper ceases. The man hangs the helpless, inert serpent, drunk with the incessant low whine of the flute, about his bare neck and breast, and comes forward to beg a rupee for his pains. Liz claps energetically. She doesn't need a snake charmer to be hypnotized by Salon. That night, she goes out for a drink with the little lady from Boston, her son, the Salon tea planter, and myself hire a guide and a carriage and go for a drink. They ride along the sickle-shaped beach of the galley face, and then inland along the shadowy dank roads under the heavy green vault of the multitudinous palms. For miles, Liz jots down every kind of tree, plant, and flower like an amateur botanist. All kinds of palms including one whose papyrus-like leaves were inscribed in the sacred writings. We pass banyan trees with roots like huge pythons coiling through the grasses, breadfruit trees, monster ferns, pools full of lotus plants and orchids growing almost as freely as weeds. Liz is intoxicated 
with all of the riches, spices, and foliage of Ceylon. She would have planted herself in this jungle if she could sprout roots of her own. With all this nature, she feels like she can hear the earth exhale. And she inhales all of it. When she goes to bed, she cracks open her window to be seduced into the sleep of the flavors of Salon for another night. Day 48, December 31st. The next morning, Elizabeth plans ahead. She goes to a travel agency and books a seat on a mail train that goes from Italy to France, the same one that Nellie took from north to south. The idea of being in Europe feels so far away. Liz doesn't want to leave. She wishes she could linger here. The tropics titillate Liz, and she's happy to put up with all of the boob sweat. And yet the clock in her head that has been quickly ticking in the back of her brain, starts to get louder. After she secured her travel plans, she heads back to the hotel and decides to take a trek through the jungle with a local guide. The guide points out different kinds of trees that Liz has never seen or heard before. He notes animal noises and picks up specimen along their path. Even in the heat, the sultry, tropical nature suits her. She feels beads of sweat drip down her back. Liz admires how her guide has his hair tied up, and she suspects that it's long. She asks him to let his hair down. He reaches behind his head, and unknots his hair. A waterfall of long, black, silky waves tumble from his head and reach his waist. Liz is in awe of his beautiful locks and then has a bright idea. She plunges her hand into a pocket and sifts through the geological layers of her bag and pulls out a bobby pin. She takes the lock of her own hair and pins it back, showing her guide how to use it. Her guide is intrigued. Then she takes his hand, opens his palm, and gives him her bobby pin. He smiles like a child on Christmas morning. He takes a lock of his hair, curls it up again, and sticks the pin in and out, in and out, in and out amazed by how his hair can be fastened. He smiles widely and then pins it to his shirt for safekeeping. Liz laughs and smiles back at him. Then the guide has a bright idea. He plunges his hand into his pocket and takes out a small, bright green fruit the size of a kumquat, wrapped in a wet lime leaf. It's a betel nut. He hands Liz the nut and mimes to her to put it in her mouth. Liz unwraps the wet lime leaf, takes the nut, puts it in her mouth, and bites down. Instantly, my mouth is full of a liquid red as blood, and my lips are shriveled with a sharp, aromatic astringent resembling cloves. I hasten to spit it out, but all day my lips are still hot and acrid from the brief experiment. Liz spits the skin out on the ground, puckers her lips together, and forces a smile through her pain. Her enthusiasm is not quite the same as her guide's, but she is polite and appreciative of his intentions and this small cultural exchange. The guide continues their adventures and brings them to a cinnamon garden surrounding a museum. 
they pass by a little old woman sitting on the ground, with a blanket laid out, selling nuts, limes, and leaves to wayward travelers. They plod along to the museum, guided by the smell of native cinnamon trees. The forest is slowly dotted with the new growth of red flowers. The next stop through the jungle is a Buddhist temple. They follow the scent of jasmine protruding from the altars, heaped with the seamless pink blossoms, and the Lord Buddha reclining on his elbow, drowsing in the semi-darkness amongst the stifling scents. Liz compares this interpretation of Buddha to all the ones she's seen from Japan to Penang. She loves the slight difference in interpretation. As she stares up at the arched temple, its frescoes of Buddhist myths and altars of flowers. About the walls are painted and arched frescoes. The pains and toils of his fifty incarnations of Buddhahood, through which he attained at last to this immortal peace. Liz feels an oldness of these sculptures and culture and religion that goes as far back as time itself. Liz notes the resting face of the Buddha lying on its side. There are nine poses that the Buddha takes, and the reclining Buddha is the symbol of encouragement. This statue symbolizes the Buddha in the last phase of his illness, before he passes over into the other dimension, a release from suffering before being reborn, as she readies herself to release 1889 into the past. But back at the hotel, Liz doesn't care about the pomp and circumstance of New Year's here. It is the last night of the old year, and the dining hall has been converted into a ballroom. The men, all in white with gay sashes around their middles, are circling languidly with pretty English girls in their arms. A high warm wind whistles through the veranda and flutters the draperies of the onlookers. People waltz lazily and gracefully. As Liz looks at everyone dancing, she doesn't have any cravings to join them. This isn't how she wants to spend her last few hours of 1889. Liz doesn't want to dance or make small talk. She just wants to be in conversation with Mother Nature. She leaves the party and slinks off to her bedroom, opens the window, puts her elbows on the sill, clasps her face in her hands, and drinks in this island. From her bedroom window, she hears the hum of the jungle, the heartbeat of the island in the depths of the forest. The night is hot and silent, full of musky perfumes of vague ghostly stories of old, unhappy, far-off things. Full of musky perfumes of vague ghostly stirrings that move with poignant mysteries, memories of the dense tropical darkness, with its silent, flitting figures, full of the glimmering, bewildered phantoms of passionate and pain that perished centuries ago. Just by listening and smelling the outside jungle air, Liz feels the pulse of the planet. She feels the energy that predates civilizations, tribes, and humans. For a moment, 
she connects with the mysterious energy of the universe and all that has come before her. This energy isn't specific to Salon, but it is because she's seen so much of the planet. It grows with every new place she visits. Liz starts to put together some of the puzzle of what is this planet. As she looks out into the velvety, violet jungle, the senses around her hypnotize her. She falls into a trance, a sultry daydream, and then falls asleep. Day 49, January 1st. She gets the sleep she really needs and wakes up with fresh eyes. Morning! The new year is calm in a beautiful green dawn. A crisp barrel sky, misty green sea, a great silent joy in the morning wind. I have sprung out of bed to receive a letter. My first one from home. A few lines scrawled on the other side of the world that I leaned from the window to read in the faint early light. How beautifully they make the new year seem. Whatever this coming year will contain of griefs and rebuffs, at least it has begun with one good moment, and for that it is well to be grateful. Fully refreshed, Liz embraces that new year energy, new decade, new country, new side of the planet. Liz looks out her window. She doesn't want to leave this paradise. The colors, the variety of flowers, the treasure trove of jewels, the friendliness of the locals, the smell of the spices in the air. As a swell of excitement rises inside her chest, she scans the outside. She is reminded of her departure as she sees her steamship waiting for her off in the distance. She's not on a pleasure trip, so she hurries to pack her bag and sail to another corner of the world. She blinks and finds herself on the deck looking out at the hotel that she was just standing in. Sad that time has passed too quickly. She just got here. She doesn't enjoy skimming the surface. As she gets up on deck and the ship pulls out of the harbor, the specifics of the island get hazy, and the farther she gets away from it, the more it transforms into an iridescent pearl upheld in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Liz holds on to the remaining tendrils of serenity and pleasure. This trip is going by too fast. The clock in the back of her brain that Liz has ignored this whole trip starts to get loud and she doesn't want to pay attention to it. On January 1st, Elizabeth Bisland set sail from the bottom of India and heads towards the Middle East. Day 56, January 8th. A week goes by on the Indian Ocean. As Nellie embarks on the Pacific, Liz is picking up speed in the Indian Ocean. As she lounges around on the spacious P&O steamship, Liz is having a hard time doing the math. Because in roughly 18 days, all of this will be over. 
And now, as she sails towards her home, the last thing she wants is for her travels to be over with. This was much more than a wild goose chase. Day 56, January 8th. A week into the new year, the day after Nellie leaves Japan, Elizabeth Bisland squints her eyes at the slab of beige land in the distance. Even from the ocean, Liz can tell that her time in the verdant tropics is over. The earth is now the color of dust and rust. All of the moisture has been sucked out of the soil. After being dipped in the tropical jungles for weeks, this must have been a record scratch moment for her. Long, colorful canoes freckle the slate blue harbor. Red, barren masses of stone broken and jagged, an astonishing aridity everywhere, all the more startling by contrast. With the fierce endurance of the lands, we have less seen. Not a drop of rain has fallen here in three years, and no green thing lives in this place. The earth is an impalpable dun powder that no roots could grasp. The rocks are seemed cracked and withered to the heart, the dust and bones of a dead land. They stop at the entrance of the Red Sea to refuel with coal. Liz notes the British warships, buoyed in the harbor, as they approach the outskirts of the waning Ottoman Empire. From a distance, Liz sees one narrow street of heavy watt stone houses with flat roofs finding the shore. And like Nellie, Liz only has time for a quick layover to load up on more coal and move on. She scans this low level white city that rests at the feet of craggy brown mountains. So when they arrive on shore, Liz and her group are carried by a carriage of ponies who take the travelers to the tanks. A system of ancient stone cisterns. These tanks are a leftover mystery from thousands of years ago. These basins are used to collect rainwater and prevent flooding, but who made them is still unknown to this day. These tanks are of unknown antiquity and are variously attributed to Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, the Arabs, and as a last guess, to the Phoenicians. Historians, when in doubt, always accuse the Phoenicians. They head to the tanks up a long dirt path. They enter through a road that cuts through the stone hills and traces along the cobbled stone basins flanked by tall, ashy mountain walls. The air is hot and dry here. The ponies bring them up a windy road from the sea to a barrier of rocks and trek through a black echoing pass 200 feet high. In this rainless region, where water falls only at intervals of years, it was necessary to collect and preserve all of it. And someone built along the hills huge stone basins with capacity of hundreds of thousands of gallons. These basins are quite perfectly still, though the name of the fateful builder thereof has long ago perished. 
the scenery rises and drops simultaneously. At the apex, Liz can see the large white town open up around her. They leave through the towering mountain walls and head down to the town. On the other side of the wall of hills is the town, a motley assemblage of more flat-topped stone dwellings, all lime-washed as white as snow. In the mist is a well where women in flowing drapery with tall jars draw water as if posing for Bible illustrations. They pass by the stucco houses covered in coal dust. This was such a whiplash from her last few locations that Liz looks for any evidence that plants can grow here. We rattle through the silent, dusty town and find beyond it a garden where a dozen feeble trees have constantly waited to be induced to grow as high as our heads, but appear discouraged and drooping and ready to give up the effort at any moment. The times of the Bible seem to step off the page and walk around in Aden. Back in Louisiana, Liz thought these were just scenes in a book, but here they're very much alive. Here the earth is barren, uninviting, inhospitable. And yet people manage to keep living here, building homes, having children, and then grandchildren, keeping their history alive. After the long ride from the mountaintop to the sea level city, they get out into the center market of the town. She walks through the rows of flat topped huts, cobbled together from stone and mud, washed in limestone, giving them a pearly sheen. The Gary pauses in the center of town to let Liz and her fellow travelers off to explore. Liz muses through hundreds of elephant tusks stacked like pyramids. Animal hides layer on top of each other. Sacks of coffee beans sit next to tins of frankincense and myrrh. Indians are draped in scarlet and gold robes as they pass by bearded Arabs and travelers from every edge of Africa. They sit at tables, smoking water pipes as trains of camels lazily walk through the streets or lay down to rest, all passing through the remnants of an ancient volcano. Liz doesn't feel like she's exploring a new place, but a new time. Aden is a spot that holds on to the energy of the oldest civilizations. The sun sets and the sky turned black fast. Liz and her crew return to the ship for dinner, then gather themselves for one last adventure. They return to the tanks. Later, when the silver fire of a full moon, by whose light one can read and see colors, has swallowed up the glittering pageant, we go again to the tanks. The oars dip in the water and streak the silver water of the moon's reflection. They get on land and, passing on the route a loaded train of camels, lurching away to the desert through the black shadows of the pass and stepping beside them lean swarthy men draped stately in white such a caravan as might have gone down to egypt to buy corn from pharaoh four thousand years ago 
Nothing in the interval changed in any way. This time, when they arrive at the tanks, they get off their gary and take a walk around. The desert air cools Liz's body. Her mind begins to hum again, and although it's late, Liz becomes fully awake. She walks along the edge of these massive basins, letting the rusty dust cover the tips of her shoes. Someone scuffles, and in a corner, a few pebbles fall into the basin. It takes a long minute for them to hit the dark water down below. She looks down into one of these pools, large, dark, and seemingly infinite, like staring into a black hole and can faintly see the outline of her own silhouette, just like thousands of other people from thousands of years ago did as well. She catches the silver moonlight ripple into one of the corners of the velvet waters. She notices how time has pockets. Some parts of the world contain the past, while others rush into the future. Something about the moonlight, the mystical eeriness, the stillness of the place takes over. Liz's brain hums with inspiration and emotion as she walks through these ancient architectural feats. For a moment, she really feels the age of the earth the galaxy, the universe at large. Liz's brain zooms through all of the history that has led her up to this moment and how so much has happened before she was even a cell. Our footsteps and our voices echo in hollow whispers from the empty tanks and the mysterious shadow of the hills Though we walk lightly and speak softly, awed by the vast, calm radiance of the night. Other than that, it is very silent in this dead and desert spot. Not a leaf to rustle, not an insect to cry, and even the sea has no speech. The world grows dreamlike and unreal, In the white silence, Liz sits in the mystical stillness under the thick blanket of the galaxy. Liz reaches out and traces her fingers along the stones. They are chalky and cold. Never has she touched anything so ancient, cobbled together by human hands. She felt as if the past looped in with the present, and she could feel the back-breaking labor of those who dug these masons. These tanks outlived whoever created them, and somehow immortalized them. What would she do with her life that would outlast her? That thought haunts her, as she turns away and returns to town. Liz and her fellow travelers return to their little pony carriage and are rocked back and forth down the dusty roads. Strange forms come out of the darkness on their path. Liz spots a man, the kind of man you expect to find in the desert, wide-eyed and filled with wisdom, who murmurs prophecies and is clothed in animal skins, walking with a wooden stick. Something about seeing him makes her feel like every problem she has ever had is so small. Every falsity and frivolousness of her life is completely banal. 
She laughs at her silliness. How could she have missed this? Just to host a tea party? No matter how overwhelming her life might feel at times, she feels how tiny she really is. She knows she is as small as her problems and surrenders to something much larger than herself. When Liz and her crew make it back to the town, they pass by the town's population, gathered in the square, playing dominoes and games at tiny tables and drinking coffee. As they pass back to the ship, Liz looks at the sea, as white as coral in the moonlight and the little gleam of lamps throughout the streets. Liz drinks in her final moments on this biblical land and goes to sleep on her ship. Day 57, January 9th. The next morning before they cast off, Liz wakes up and the clock that she's been so good at ignoring throughout this whole race is suddenly blasting in her ears. But she needs one last look at this magnificent world before she is pulled away from it forever. Liz goes up on deck, then suddenly she's startled. She notices a man lounging in a bamboo chair. She gets a little self-conscious because she's not done up yet. But then she thinks. I hesitate a moment, conscious of the dishevelment of locks beneath the lace scarf tied under my chin. But think better of the hesitation and remain. I may never see this again, this world where one is really for the first time Lord of the Senses Five, where the light of night and of day have a new meaning, where one is drenched and seeped in color and perfused where the husk of callous dullness falls away and every sense replies to impressions with a keenness as of newborn faculties. She tries to take a photo with her mind, looking at every detail with full intensity. She watches. A man watching a long, narrow boat filled with oranges, heaped up in the center, cutting a delicate furrow along the pearly lilac of the glass-like sea. A faint gray mist Scarcely more than a film lies along the shore. Above it, the red rocks stand up sharply against the white sky, where the coming sun is changing to gold. Liz thinks back to her fight with JBW and quietly thanks this crazy man who put her on this journey. How mundane these last few months would have been in comparison to what she is actually doing. How different her life would have been if she'd never left. Like a seed breaking through soil, her brain cracks open and grows. She knows how tiny she is in this vast universe, but she is one with it. She surrenders and wants the universe to swallow her whole. Liz feels her throat start to dry and choke a little. Not because of how dry the air is, but because her journey is starting to end. And she is so grateful that she got to see a glimpse of what the world has to offer. Every moment I have spent in the tropics is, to me, just as vivid as this. I see everything, 
Not a beauty, not a touch of color escapes me. Every moment of the bay means intense delight, beautiful life. I can live back in it in every emotion. It is well to have thus once really lived. Her time here is up. The world and the clock is spinning too fast for Liz, and she wants nothing more than to stay here longer. But as the boat pulls out of the harbor, she quiets that thought because she knows it's better to be somewhere briefly than to never go at all. Liz takes one more breath, inhales the dust and the smell of coal, and feels the boat drag out of the harbor. She holds on to that feeling as she takes on the final third of her journey. She holds on to that moment of peace because from this moment on, there will be no resting. Now, with Elizabeth Bisland looking to the west and Nellie Bly looking to the east, they both have their eyes on the same tiny spot of land. On day 57, January 9th, Elizabeth Bisland pulls out of Aden and passes Nellie Bly's pace as she sets sail for Europe. A Race Around the World was written, produced, researched, narrated, scripted, edited, re-edited, edited again, soundscaped, scored, mixed, and mastered by me, Adrian Bain. Sam Dingman was our editorial consultant and emotional support. Father Time was played by Jake Dingman. Resources include 80 Days by Matthew Goodman, in Seven Stages, A Flying Trip Around the World by Elizabeth Bisland. And for more resources, go to our website, strangersabroadpodcast.com. Please go to Apple Podcasts to rate, review, and subscribe to A Race Around the World. If you leave a review, I will read it at the end of the credits, like... Southern Belle Babes gives it five stars and says, Team Liz over here, but love this show. Thank you. And if you're interested in all of the bonus content, anecdotes, and historical facts that didn't get into the show, head over to our TikTok at Strangers Abroad Podcast. If you would like to email us, please send over a lovely message to strangersabroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening and come back next week for the next leg in the adventure of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland. Safe travels to everyone listening.